Fund Association and CEO of Hedge Fund PR. Thank you for joining us for the HFA webinar, New Opportunities for Hedge Fund Marketing, How to Create an Effective Ad Campaign While Avoiding Regulatory Pitfalls, sponsored by LXC Media and Marketing. The passage of the JOBS Act now empowers hedge funds with many new choices to accelerate capital raising and stand out from the competition. Today we have two highly accomplished experts to help guide you on how to capitalize on these recent changes in a compliant and effective way. Steve Saltstein, the managing partner of LXC Marketing and Media. LXC Marketing and Media is an advertising agency that is focused on helping clients increase assets under management through lead generation, brand and message refinement, digital asset utilization, PR, experiential marketing, media buying and advertisement creation. Now that the restrictions on general solicitation are lifted, hedge funds, private equity funds, VCs have an unprecedented opportunity to increase AUM. LXC's focus is on helping funds and 40 Act companies develop strategies targeted towards accredited investors, pension funds, SFOs, MFOs, sovereign wealth funds, endowments, insurance companies, and platforms. LXC is a subsidiary of RedPed Marketing, whose client list includes Chase, Fidelity, Mercedes-Benz, Geico, General Motors, among others. LXC's team is made up of formal portfolio managers, fund business development executives, and advertising professionals. On a combined basis, the team managed over $1.9 billion in assets and has experienced raising money from various allocators, including Chicago teachers, CalSTRS, international banks, family offices, and sovereign wealth funds. Also with us today is Brad Caswell, the special counsel of Schulte, Roth, and Zabel. Brad is special counsel in the New York office, where his practice focuses on counseling hedge fund and private equity funds on operational, regulatory, and compliance matters. He provides guidance to clients on a broad range of issues, including those related to the U.S. Investment Advisors Act, other federal, state, and self-regulatory organization requirements, and securities trading rules in the U.S. Brad also provides guidance to clients with operations in Hong Kong, Japan, and other markets throughout Asia and the U.K. with respect to regulatory compliance, trading, and operations. With 12, 12 years of in-house experience, including general counsel and chief compliance officer of investment advisors ranging from multi-billion dollar funds to startups, his experience in the asset management group of leading the investment bank. Brad offers valuable perspective on investment management operations and compliance issues. He is a 1996 graduate of Boston College Law School and a 1992 graduate of Georgetown. So thank you, Steve and Brad. I'm going to turn the webinar over to you. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Saltstein, and I'm with LXE Marketing and Media. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone um, for joining us this morning uh, and dialing into the webinar, uh, as well as I wanted to thank uh, the HFA and uh, especially Schulte Roth uh, for joining us on today's call. Um, I wanted to dive right in here uh, to uh, you talk about what we consider to be a um, extraordinary and underutilized opportunity for funds uh, to market and advertise. Um, and that's actually utilizing the old rules, 506B. Uh, you know, while the Jobs Act has garnered a tremendous amount of attention, um, and you know, it is a extraordinary milestone uh, in regards to uh, hedge fund marketing and advertising, uh, we feel um, that many funds have lost sight of the fact that there is an opportunity that's been created by Dodd-Frank and the fact that funds have had to register. Um, and therefore, you know, they are now positioned to put together a very effective marketing and advertising campaign uh, utilizing the old rules. Um, so look, there are restrictions when doing that, and you know there are nuances to it, but it is a, a tremendous opportunity in its own right. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the new rules, the Jobs Act, 506C, uh, presents an unprecedented opportunity uh, for funds to create uh, you know, incredibly effective marketing and advertising campaigns. Uh, you know, the other thing we want to point out is if funds elect to jump into the Jobs Act pool and utilize 506C, uh, 
uh, listen, there's, there's no question that uh, there are uh, great responsibilities that go with that. Um, and you know, they absolutely need to make sure that uh, they are completely buttoned up when they decide to embark on their, on their campaign. The, the flip side of that, however, is there's a tremendous opportunity uh, for funds to define their category uh, and really uh, create their brand uh, around their strategy. You know, it's the equivalent of being uh, a car manufacturer, okay, and for the first time uh, having the ability to advertise the fact that you've created a new S SUV. Um, if you are uh, the first credit fund or uh, the first event-driven fund uh, to go out there and embark on an advertising campaign uh, and define what it means to be a credit fund, to define your category, uh, it really is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. I mean, it, it is the equivalent of writing your own RFP. Um, and, and an opportunity like this does not come around often. Uh, you know, it happened uh, a while back in the uh, legal industry, in the accounting industry, and, you know, one of the best corollaries here is the pharmaceutical industry, where prior to 1984, pharmaceutical companies were not allowed to advertise. Um, and after uh, 84, you know, what you found was it wasn't um, the largest companies that won the war. It was the companies that spent the most on marketing and advertising. Um, so, you know, this, once again, you know, this is an opportunity. Um, it doesn't come around often, and uh, there are absolutely going to be funds that, uh, that take advantage of it. Yes, this is Brad Coswell. Thank you, thank you Steve. Uh, I also like to thank the HFA for putting on this webinar and for Steve for, um, for organizing it. Um, before I get into some of the legal background here, just have to read the standard disclaimer that this is not legal advice, that uh, this is general information. If you, if you do need legal advice, you should talk to your attorney for specifics. But you know, with that said, we'd like to give a little bit of background on where we are, you know, the historical background here, and the opportunity under the JOBS Act. Steve, you're exactly right. This is a significant opportunity. It can be done. We're going to talk about how you can do it in the right way and comply. Um, so let's, to do this, let's talk about where we are today and historically, the, you know, uh, the private fund industry. Private funds have always been just that. They've been private, the funds. Right? You, if you were a registered advisor, you could talk about the advisor. But I'm sure when you were talking to your lawyers, they told you, do not talk about the funds. Why is that? It's because the funds have been relying on an exemption from registration under Rule 506 of Regulation D. The general rule in the U.S. is that you cannot offer securities in the U.S. or to U.S. persons unless, the, unless you're registered or you have an exemption. And the private fund industry has historically relied on Rule 506, which has two requirements. Number one, no general solicitation or general advertising. Again, you can't advertise the funds. Um, number two, you can only make offers and sales to accredited investors. And as I'm sure you've also probably heard, one way to establish and to establish this exemption and to show that you've not conducted a general solicitation, general advertising, is if you limit your marketing of the funds to only investors where you have a substantive pre-existing relationship. So bottom line, you're doing a private offering of the funds. You're only talking to accredited investors with whom you have a substantive pre-existing relationship. And this is the exemption that the private fund industry has relied on historically. The JOBS Act really represents a new paradigm. And as we talked about, it offers new opportunities in this area. The, you know, as many of you know, the JOBS Act was signed by the President into law in 2012. The SEC just came out with final rules July 2013. And the way the final rules work here is it, they present an option, an opt-in approach. They maintain the historical exemption for private offerings, 
which was under 506, is now called 506B. So that is still an option. You can still do a private offering uh, and, and you know, conduct it as we just discussed. However, the, the Jobs Act rules offer another option, which is the new rule 506C. The under 506C, the prohibition against general solicitation and general advertising is lifted. It would not apply to offers and sales under 506C if you elect that option, provided that all purchasers of the securities are in fact accredited investors and the issuer takes reasonable steps to verify that the purchasers are accredited investors. So there's this new option, you can opt into it, but there's some strings attached. So you have to figure out what's right for your firm to make sure you comply with that. One of the requirements here is that if you're going to take advantage of this new Rule 506C under the JOBS Act and conduct a general solicitation or general advertising of your funds, you will have to amend your Form D. They've added a new box on the Form D to check for 506C, and you will need to do that prior to take advantage, taking advantage of this new option. So, um, you know, what does the JOBS Act allow you to do? Well, you know, in a very basic manner, uh, allows you to call, email, uh, entertain, and advertise. One thing to keep in mind is you, you can do this uh, with the old rules, 506B, as well. And, you know, who are we going after? We're going after both the institutional uh, investor base uh, and uh, the high net worth individuals. So pensions, endowments, platforms, uh, insurance companies, SFO, Taft-Hartley, uh, and sovereigns. I mean, just to, uh, to make one point, and, uh, you know, follow-on point to that is that under the current rules, if you're a registered advisor, you can talk about the advisor. So that's what we're talking about. Under, the, you know, under these current rules, you can, you know, you, if you're registered, you can talk about the advisor. You just can't talk about the funds. What the 506C, the Jobs Act, offers you is the ability now to actually advertise your funds if you can comply with the requirements. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about what the requirements are. Um, as I mentioned, you know, to, to take advantage of 506C, you have to update your Form D, right? But you also have to, the, the two requirements are that all investors are actually accredited investors, and number two, that you take reasonable steps to verify their accredited investor status. Reasonable steps to verify. What does that mean? Well, in the rule, the SEC decided to take a flexible approach which many in the industry actually appreciated, rather than setting forth strict, specific requirements on what you have to get from investors to verify that they're accredited. The SEC basically said it's a fact and circumstances analysis. Um, so, but they did, they did talk about some of the principles that a firm would look at in determining what it would need to get from investors to verify that they're accredited investors. Um, and, and some of the principles that the SEC listed in the final rule release are you would look at the nature of the purchaser. Is it an individual? Right? Is, is the investor a public pension fund? Um, so look at the nature of the purchaser. The amount of the information the firm has about the purchaser. So if the investor has already invested with you, there, there may be very little additional information you need to get to verify that they're an accredited investor. And then also the nature of the offering. You know, what is the minimum investment amount? If the minimum investment amount is a million dollars and you know, the accredited investor standard requires a million dollars for individuals, a million dollars of net worth excluding their primary residence, then provided that that individual has not financed their subscription, there may be very little that you have to get in addition. The SEC did include in the final rule release a non-exclusive safe harbor for individual investors in terms of what you need to get to verify that they're accredited investors. Um, and the list of methods that the SEC recited in the final rule 
um, reviewing an investor's tax forms or bank statements and credit reports, obtaining confirmation from a third party, like a broker-dealer, that the investor actually does meet the accredited investor standards, um, or for additional subscriptions, a recon simple reconfirmation from the investor. And the, the uh, SEC noted in the final rule release, it really depends upon the facts and circumstances of what you'll need to get from investors to verify. Uh, little in the way of reasonable steps may have to be taken to verify that a, a public uh, a state employee benefit plan meets the accredited investors test. However, if it's a natural person, you may need to get more. Um, the SEC actually said that if, you know, in certain cases, no additional steps to verify accredited investor status may be required. If the invest, as I mentioned, if the investment minimum is sufficiently high and you can confirm that the investor has not financed that investment amount. So it really is you know, it is something that you know, is manageable. You're just going to have to think about for your firm, based upon the types of investors, you know, what steps you need to put in place to reasonably verify that they actually are accredited investors. Historically, it's been people check off the boxes in the sub docs. You, that's not going to be enough under new 506C. You're going to have to take some steps to verify that they actually are accredited investors, and you're going to need to keep records of what steps that you've taken. So, Brad, uh, you know, one thing is um, we've spoken with and uh, in certain cases have been working with, uh, there are a number of software providers out there yeah. right now, like Second Market, um, et cetera, that uh, basically have pretty um, uh, efficient plug-and-play type software. It's not all that expensive on a per-investor basis where yeah. they will do the third-party verification for you. Yeah, absolutely. That, that could be really helpful and um, you can, you know, in, in many cases, satisfy the requirements or at least supplement what you're doing. And then the other thing is, you know, look, we, we've thought about this a great deal and, you know, our thought process is, you know, water seeks its own level. So, um, the the easiest way to for an investor to really kind of tackle this is uh, just to get their accountant involved and have their accountant send the statement because more than likely the accountant has this information um, already and so therefore the uh, the investor doesn't have to give their information to anybody that they don't know. Yeah, I mean some investors may not want to provide you know that kind of financial information. Um, you know they may want to just have an accountant or a broker dealer give a representation. Um, so yeah, I mean that 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 might work. It really is just going to have to be you have to would, would that be enough? Would, would it be enough for an accountant to basically send a letter saying, you know, yes, I verify that this this investor is in fact accredited. Yeah, it, it could be. It, it kind of depends on, you know that the accountants actually have both the asset and liability information that they can verify, you know, which right. they should, but it could be. I mean, the SEC, for individuals, um, at least in the non-exclusive safe harbor, that they actually listed obtaining a confirmation from a third party, including an accountant. Right. So for an individual investor, that may be enough. Right. Okay. Um, but it really is, as you said, I mean, as this shakes out, you know, best practices will develop in the industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for those who are using, who want to use 506C now, you just have to think about your investors, set set up your compliance policies to do this, and keep records of it. Um, as I said, it's manageable. It's just it's another level of compliance responsibility on firms, which sure. Uh, so it's just something you need to do. Um, so you know, let's take a look at uh, you know what makes up uh, a marketing and advertising campaign. Uh, and the first thing I'll say is not every fund needs to do all of this, okay? These are just basically, you know, the seven steps in creating a comprehensive marketing and advertising campaign. And, you know, what I tell my clients is, and, and you know, frankly, not everyone uh, is amenable to doing this, but, you know, it is a very logical first step that, you know, really what, what funds should do is uh, begin with an institutional perception study. Uh, look, if there's roughly 9,000 funds out there, um, you know, how many of them uh, have 
embarked on a marketing campaign, have you know put together their collateral material, et cetera, um, and they're not, they don't really know what the allocators think of them. They don't really know, you know what allocators think of their specific space, be it uh, event-driven or relative value or you know, whatever it might be. Um, and so it's really important as much as possible uh, to you know, collect as much data and information from um, the allocating community. Uh, so that way you, know, you can have the most uh, effective brand message and marketing campaign possible. Um, so, you know, once you've done that, uh, then we, we turn our sights onto the brand and the message. And, uh, you know, that's really uh, what is going to be pervasive throughout your entire campaign. Um, and we spend, you know, a tremendous amount of time trying to get to the brand truth um, and helping funds, you know, really just understand, you know, what is your true edge and, you know, what is the best way to position this so that you uh, can you know send that message out effectively to the allocating community? So you know that's what brand uh, and message is all about, and then that should be pervasive. For instance, throughout your collateral material, um, you know which uh, we can absolutely help you put together. Um, and for instance, you know should be a large component of uh, everything that you do with digital. So when we talk about digital, uh, everything really. Um, uh, comes out of, spurs out of your website. Okay, so your website, you should consider your website to be kind of digital HQ. Uh, and then from there, um, you can do incredibly effective uh, targeting, okay, to both the, alloc the institutional allocating community um, as well as uh, the, uh, the high net worth individual community. So um, you can utilize social media Right, and and you know every fund should be doing this, utilizing social media, uh, taking advantage of blogging opportunities. Um, you know, if if you know, funds want to get uh, um, very, uh, if funds really want to work with search and and make the investment uh, around search, um, and you know really use these tools in order to create uh, your online uh, reputation, which you know ultimately. You know, what we're trying to do here is uh, what we're really targeted at is lead generation, right? When we work with our funds, we want to give them as many at-bats as possible. And, you know, digital is a great way to do this uh, in a leveraged environment. Uh, the other thing uh, most funds should be thinking about is a uh, PR and thought leadership campaign. Uh, so I'm not necessarily saying that you should expect to be on CNBC or Bloomberg, although... Uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, if that's your goal, um, you know, that's something we can help you with. But, you know, just uh, getting placements, let's say, in P&I and II, um, and, you know, really putting together uh, effective white papers that will, you know, make people think and, uh, you know, get the phone to ring and, and hopefully will uh, extend all the way through, you know, the gatekeepers, the consultants, um, because at the end of the day, obviously, they have tremendous sway uh, and, uh, influence in the industry. Um, then there's experiential. So, look, once again, you don't have to be a $10 billion fund uh, to take advantage of experiential marketing. And what I'm talking about when I mention experiential are doing things like uh, coupling your fund with the likes of uh, a, a golf event, the Masters, the U.S. Open, uh, perhaps the America's Cup. And, you know, look, there are ways to do this uh, if you're a large fund um, where, you know, if, if we're at the Masters and if you, and by the way, this is, you can do this under 506B, the old rules, okay? If you're at the Masters and, you know, you're trying to, you know, really extend your brand uh, and you put up a tent where, you know, Phil, Mil Phil Nicholson is uh, coming around the 16th hole and perhaps you see, you know, your brand in the background, um, you know, that's a great way to do it. But there's also a way to do it inexpensively. Um, where you know you can kind of feed off these events uh, and still have it be an excellent environment where you can have existing and prospective investors and get those people in under the tent, so to speak. Uh, and then finally, there's media buying and advertising. Um, and uh, you know, so advertising could be everything from uh, from print to uh, TV. Um, we are working with. Uh, uh, NBC, uh, CNBC, and the Golf Channel uh, offering out um, you know commercials for this vertical, which I'm going to talk about further. But so that should give you like a general overview of what you should be thinking of 
when you begin to uh, you know put together your campaign. And 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 once again, uh, you know, please keep in mind you can do this under the confines of the old rules, 506B. So you know, be careful, right? We're not talking. You're not going to mention your fund in this environment. You know, really, what you should be thinking about in regards to the old rules in 506B is brand building. Okay, and you could do it under the new rules, the Jobs Act, 506C. Yeah. And yeah, there's there's several other legal issues that you should think about um, if you are going to utilize 506C, and I'll just highlight a few of them here. Um, First, not, you know, as I mentioned, one of the requirements of 506C is that all the investors are accredited investors. So if you have knowledgeable employees uh, in your funds, um, this may pose an issue for you if they're not actually accredited investors. Now, the accredited investor standard is not that significant, so it, you know, it may not be an issue. Uh, secondly, you know, this is not... Uh, it's not entirely clear from the rules, but there may be integration issues if you have, you know, the similar strategy funds where you're relying on 506B and you're doing a private offering, and then you launch another fund which is 506C. Um, as to whether there there could be integration and the whether the um, you know the, the C offering could somehow impact your private offering. You know, it's interesting, uh, and I know you're not talking about this, but um I was just at a hedge fund conference, and I met a gentleman. Uh, and I think, you know, with what's going on with liquid alternatives and 40 act funds, you're going to see a lot of this. I met a gentleman who's kind of a smaller fund, but he had both a mutual fund uh, and a hedge fund. Yeah. And um, so, you know, he was doing a tremendous amount of uh, marketing, um, you know, under the confines of uh, promoting mutual fund. But uh, you know, it helps, and it, it uh, certainly, um, you know, it helps the hedge fund as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you know. Funds do it now. They set up kind of walls between between the two, and the kind of practical considerations there. You really should think about how you can separate them so as not to. Um, but would you say that, would you say the golden rule is so if you know, let, let's say you have both. I mean, generally, what you should be thinking the golden rule is your campaign should be focused on your brand, right? You should not really be getting down into the details. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's really. You know the advisor. I mean, right. more so. The umbrella. And, and again, you can be doing that under 506B as long as you're registered as a registered investment advisor. If you're if you're not, then you know there's other issues. Um, another uh, thing to consider is the CFTC has really not come up to speed on this. Um, so we have the SEC rules, but you know there's still some issues um, with the you know, if you're relying commodity pool operator is relying on certain exemptions. Um, there's some limitations on marketing to the public uh, in those exemptions. So you'll need to consider that um, you know, before you, you launch into 506C. Uh, and then finally, there is, um, you know, if you are, I'm sure that many of you are considering AIFMD. Marketing globally. Uh, marketing, marketing globally. You know the AIFMD directive in the EU, uh, and you'll need to think about like which markets that you're targeting to make sure that anything you do does not um, kind of pull you into those countries because each of the countries in the EU has different definitions of what is marketing. So you should just you know consider that issue as well. Let, let me ask you a question about that. Uh, what's your thought process around a website? So let me give you two scenarios. One scenario is you have a U.S. fund who is only going to be marketing in the U.S., uh, and then you have a U.S. fund that's you know going to be marketing both in the U.S. and internationally. What should they be thinking about in regards to their website to keep it compliant? Well, I mean, most websites have, you know, when you, when you sign in, you have to indicate if you're in the U.S., if you're in Europe, and then you will have some type of blockers, to, you know, and also clear disclaimers on the website to try to try to limit it. But I would, I would also, there's no easy answer here because the difficulty is each of the EU countries has different definitions of what's marketing. So, you know, you could, a website might not be marketing in the UK, but it could be in some of the other jurisdictions. And if you're targeting investors in there, you don't want to blow, you know, if you're relying on a reverse solicitation argument, 
under the directive, or you, know, you just want to think about before you do it, like which countries are you looking at, and uh, just be careful. And okay. let, let me ask you a question about CFTC. Um, so, you know, one one thing we have found um, that seems to be a new trend in fund marketing is video. Funds are making documentary style videos uh, to kind of just you know talk about their edge, their passion, their team. Um, and you know those could be either 506B or 506C compliant. Um, but um, let me let me ask you a question about the use of a video in regards to if you are uh, under the CFTC umbrella. Um, you know could a fund utilize you know one of these let's just call them introductory videos, uh, but only keep it to um, accredited investors, perhaps put it on you know databases like uh, Alpha Matrix, etc that you know really are focused on the the CTA community uh, but you know and not let it get out there for general consumption would would that uh, if you keep it to accredited and you know perhaps databases and and let's say your your email list of pre-qualified prospective investors is that uh, generally yeah because you're still doing a private offering um, under those under that fact pattern. So it would still be a private offering as long as you're not putting it up on your website. Right. Or putting it up publicly. No YouTube, so to speak. Uh, and then you you know you would need to, as we'll talk about in a little while, you need to make sure it complies with the uh, both the SEC advertising rules and you know, the CFTC <laughs> has its own set of rules. So uh, yeah, I mean again, it, it, if you're going to keep it to a private, it, it's kind of like a pitch book that you would give to right. a, um, you know, it, you'd give to an accredited investor now and in, on a private offering basis where you have a substantive pre-existing relationship, you could give them a video as long as you're kind of complying with the rules at the same time. Right. And, and yeah. So, you know, I, I've met uh, a, a number of uh, fund managers that are under the CFTC umbrella and uh, they're upset. They feel like they're going to be at a disadvantage here. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. And um, by the way, what, what is it 5%, 5% of your AUM? Well, that's a de minimis exemption. There's, there's also, uh, there's other exemptions, or there's full registration. Uh, interestingly enough, if you're fully registered with the CFTC, there's no issue. But not many firms want to be fully registered because then you're actually sending. That's uh, so. It's the equivalent of being registered with the SEC under Dodd Frank. Yeah, but the CFTC, the requirements are they're they're, they're much different in terms of uh, you have to send your PPM in to be reviewed. It's it, there's a whole right list of. Okay, so uh, one additional uh, thing we should talk about is the uh, the fact that when the SEC issued the final rules under the Jobs Act, they also proposed some additional rules, which is something that you should consider and at least know that they're they're out there. Um, the, the comment period ended September 23rd. However, the SEC just extended the comment period for another month. So uh, these are just proposed. These are not final and. You know, there, there's, uh, you know, at least another month, probably sometime in November um, until at the earliest that you see action on this. And, you know, many in the industry, there's a big debate as to whether these will be scaled back. But I just wanted to at least highlight for you what they are. Um, the proposed rules, um, right now, if you're relying on 506 of Reg D, you have to file a Form D. Um, at the time of the offering. The proposed rules would change the Form D requirements to require an advanced filing and um, and basically would also include certain penalty features for managers that fail to comply with these technical Form D requirements. And, and you know, this proposed rule would basically ban you, bar you from being able to um, from filing Form Ds or relying on it for a period of, I believe it's a year. So, and this applies to all Reg D offerings. So if these proposed rules go into effect, it applies to B and C, not just the Jobs Act. So just keep that in mind. The, um, the other point I wanted to highlight here is that the proposed rules, that if you're going to take advantage of C, what's being proposed is that for a temporary period of time, um, right now it's talked about for two years, if you're taking advantage of C, you would need to file the materials that you're using in the general solicitation with the SEC. Um, so if you're doing a video, if you're doing, you would actually need to send that into the SEC. Um, 
So again, this is proposed. We'll see where it shakes out. Uh, hopefully, will be additional clarity over the coming months. The one thing I want to just point out in regards to the two-year period is, if you're going to um, implement a campaign under 506C, that information is going to be out there anyway, right? For yeah. That, for, yeah, yeah, for everyone to see anyway. So, um, so look, you know. I just wanted to, people to you know, truly understand what the relationship universe looks like uh, in kind of a uh, Jobs Act, a post-Jobs Act environment now that it's implemented. So, you know, if you look at these middle arrows, right? I mean, the way the universe uh, historically has been, hedge funds typically would go through, let's say, third-party marketers or their internal marketers um, to, you know, approach and try to get through these gatekeepers, which are the consultants, the investment platforms, uh, financial advisors, etc ultimately to, you know, get to the institutional allocators. Um, and, you know, the way the world now works is, you know, hedge funds can go directly. They can, uh, you know, go directly both to the high net worth individuals uh, and these institutional allocators. So uh, it's just an interesting way of looking at it. Um, this slide is really geared toward video. You know, as I said, we're seeing, you know, a tremendous uptick of uh, funds putting together these videos. You know, one issue with, let's say, marketing um, either in Europe uh, or Asia or, you know, listen, even across the country is that allocators do not have the opportunity to see the whites of your eyes. And, you know, video is a fantastic way for them really to understand kind of who you are um, and your team. Uh, you know, so we have funds uh, that are now pre-recording the 10 most likely due diligence questions that allocators are going to ask. Um, some funds have now, you know, come to us and said, listen, we'd like to do small videos for each member of our team. Uh, and listen, look, you know, once again, everything is about lead generation, right? So you want, as a fund manager, to put yourself in the best possible position to get allocations, to make it as easy as possible for the allocator to get comfortable with you and your team. And, uh, you know, this is a great way to kind of bridge the gap, to bridge those miles. So, yeah, and, and, um you know, in addition to video, which, you know, as we talked about, you, you know, you could do under 506B if you're limiting it to the advisor or under C if you're talking about the funds and complying with the requirements. You know, there's, there's a whole new host of new marketing materials that, you know, you know, will gradually flow from 506C. I mean, you know, your portfolio managers will now be able to talk to the press, um, talk it at conferences. Uh, be able to correct inaccuracies that are in the press. Whereas before we've advised clients, you can't talk about your fund, you cannot, even if something is inaccurate, you have to be careful to not to be viewed as advertising your fund. If you take advantage of C, you'll be able to, to do that. Um, you know, what Steve's talked about websites, you know, speaking engagements, articles, they're just social media. I mean, they're, they're all of these types of marketing materials, um, you know, will be, if you take advantage of C, you know, may be available. And we'll talk about in a little while, you know, what you need to think about if you're going to do that, because that poses some challenges. Um, so, you know, let's talk about, uh, you know, thought process around, you know, who is utilizing advertising um, and, and how. So obviously, uh, what I call the super funds, which are the Blackstones and Black Rocks of the world, uh, because, you know, a lot of those funds, Apollo, et cetera, are already public, and they have two, three, four hundred thousand investors as a public company anyway, it's very easy for them um, to now, uh, you know, uh, take their um, team and start marketing their funds. I was at a uh, conference last week uh, where the general counsel of uh, BlackRock spoke and, you know, she couldn't be happier about the fact that the Jobs Act has finally been ratified and, uh, you know, it's quite obvious that BlackRock already um, is um, aggressive with their advertising. You know, for them, it's just a short walk across the street to now start doing the same thing for their hedge funds. Um, you know, the other thing is I've had some pretty interesting conversations recently with, you know, very large, very established conservative funds. You know, just picture a credit fund that's been around for 20 plus years. Uh, they have a pristine track record uh, and the most blue chip investor base possible. But even they said to me, you know, look, Steve, uh, we understand um, obviously how these things work. So, you know, one thing they were concerned about is kind of looking out of step and, and looking 
uh, dusty, for lack of a better term. Uh, and they said to me, listen, you know, we know how the process works, right? So, for instance, you know, if a consultant uh, gets a mandate and, um, you, you know, the, the, the internal process typically is they'll then, you know, give it off to uh, their analyst, right, who typically is a newly minted MBA. And they'll say to him, look, we have a new mandate for an event-driven fund. We want you to comb through these, you know, 500 event-driven funds and come back to us with a short list of 25. Uh, and that's how the process, how the, that's how the ball typically gets rolling. And what they said to us was, look, these, these analysts, right, are all, they're all digitally focused. They, they've all grown up in a digital environment. And, and if we don't, um, you know, have uh, an um, acceptable digital presence, an acceptable website, you know, they're going to start thinking that we're out of step. So I was very impressed and, you know, happily surprised. Uh, that they are thinking about these things and plan on instituting these things. You know, the other thing is a, a fund like that um, most likely will rely more on uh, things that will elevate their brand, right? You know, what I was talking about before, putting up that tent at the masters, um, as opposed to, you know, more proactive, um, let's say, just what you would typically think when I use the term advertising. But uh, so, you know, they, you know, our sense is they are going to beef up their digital presence. They are going to do more experiential, putting up tents, et cetera. And that's how they're going to tackle it. Uh, emerging managers, um, obviously, uh, you're going to see a lot of them um, designate to uh, utilize 506C. And it's going to be, um, you know, they're the ones who are going to be the most aggressive. I think that's uh, a given. The other uh, characteristic of a fund uh, that you're going to see probably taking advantage of this are funds that are stalled out, right? So, um, you know, you may have a you know, six, seven hundred million dollar um, relative value fund that, you know, typically good pedigree, but they haven't been able to increase AUM uh, because their returns are not top quartile. Um, so, you know, I've had these conversations where funds have not, you know, increased uh, AUM over the last couple of years. They're frustrated, and they look at this as a, um, a, a new way, uh, possibly, to kind of you know, restart the asset gathering engine. Uh, and then finally, uh, tech funds. Um, you know, I, I would say if I, if I could characterize uh, tech funds in, in any specific manner, it would be frustrated. You know, every conversation I have with them, they, they almost find it offensive that they're not allowed to use social media in order to get their brand and message out there. Um, so I think that you're going to see a lot of tech funds uh, move quickly on this as well. So, you know, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, obviously our business, the hedge fund, private equity fund business, has gotten more and more institutionalized. And, um, you know, what that has done is uh, the, the larger funds have gotten larger and the smaller funds um, are, are getting smaller. And we think, you know, one thing that this will do is, uh, put smaller funds in a position where, uh, you know, they can be on a more level playing field in regards to asset gathering. Um, so, you know, here's um, a group that we're working with right now. Uh, we're working with uh, both the, Go the Golf Channel, um, CNBC, and, and NBC. Um, they have put together specific packages for um, the hedge fund and private equity fund community. Uh, and, you know, one thing to keep in mind is, uh, as uh, if, if, for instance, the, the Golf Channel has uh, the most uh, affluent uh, viewers in television. Um, and then, uh, you know, CNBC, you, you know, if you're in a position where, you know, you're solely focused on QPs, um, they have more uh, people with uh, $10 million or more than, uh, than any other channel out there. So, you know, just to give you a sense, of you know what this whole opportunity means you know let's say the whole fund industry the whole hedge fund industry is you know roughly two trillion dollars uh, potential allocations from just high net worth individuals alone represents eleven trillion dollars uh, and it is uh, it is a, a huge opportunity so you know the the other thing to keep in mind and, and we get this you know we speak to a lot of funds who market using exclusivity right I've I've had a number of conversations where uh, funds want to have, and, and I, this is effective, and I agree with this, funds want to have um, the perception that it's, it's you know, difficult to get into their fund. Uh, but there are still uh, you know, ways for funds to 
uh, covertly, let's say, you know, market and advertise and make sure that their brand is still out there while, uh, you know, keeping their, um, keep, keeping this uh, exclusive thought process in the allocating community. Okay, great. Uh, the, um, yeah, we, so we've talked about all the opportunities for um, you know, new types of marketing, um, marketing materials. You know, one, one additional point that we want to talk about is, uh, and that you have to, have to think about, again, manageable, but just you have, to, you have to deal with it, is the fact that the advertising rule under the Investment Advisors Act is not going away. So you can now advertise if you take advantage of C, but you have to com comply with the rules of the road for those advertisements. There's things you can say, there's things you can't say, um, and you know, it, it, and obviously the SEC looks at marketing materials very closely. So you you, you just need to, and this will raise some additional challenges for legal compliance. Um, you know, if if the PM is going to do a is going to be on CNBC. I mean, you probably want to meet beforehand and come up with a script and talk about yeah, absolutely. what you can do and what you can't do. You want to make sure it's consistent with what you said on that video. You yeah. know, so you, you really want to kind of employ some common sense, practical uh, policies here. So, you know, the, as I said, the advertising rule, um, you know, under the Advisors Act, you know, it, it's basically it's in the Advisors Act, but the, the rules for advisors in terms of marketing go further. Basically, there's a string of SEC no action letters with together with the Advisors Act make up the advertising rules for advisors. So we often get the question from clients about, you know, where is where does it say this in the Advisors Act? Or where, where does it say it in the rules? And it, it may not, but it's in an SEC no action letter, and that is the guidance that we have, and, and we also represent many clients in SEC examinations, so we know what the SEC is focused on. Um, so let me, let me just hit on a few of these, of the, I guess, the top five, uh, net versus gross returns. When if you're a registered advisor and you're talking about your performance, which is fine, you have to make sure you're showing net of fees and expenses, not just gross. Um, these are the returns that an investor would actually get. They're not going to get the gross returns, so you know, we often get questions: Can we show both? And you know, as long as they're kind of equally shown, then you can show net and gross. For private equity firms, it gets somewhat more complicated, but it still can be done. Uh, second, no cherry picking of investments. This is a focus area for the SEC. Um, you can't just show your winners <laughs> and 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 leave out the losers. I mean, it, it, as a general rule. You know, you could talk about overall fund performance, and you could talk about a couple of sample trades, but leave out the performance of those, or show show all the performance. I mean, it, you have to be careful with this. Uh, third, you know, hypothetical hypothetical model or back tested performance. Um, you know, it can be shown. You know, you have to make sure it's not false and misleading, and you have to have this, you know disclaimers about what you're showing. What is it? What you know? Any differences with the fund, you should make sure that's clear, so you know an investor can't claim that they were, that this was misleading. Um, if you're using a placement agent, a FINRA replacement agent, this is going to be more difficult because the FINRA rules are even stricter than the SEC rules. Um, use of prior related performance. So if you're starting up your a new shop and you want to use your track record, you know that can be done if you meet certain requirements that are set forth in the SEC uh, no action letters, that it's actually your track record, uh, that you were the, the lead for, you know, you were making the investment decisions, that the, the strategy is substantially the same, that you have records to be able to back it up. So, you know, again, it can be done, but you just have to, it has to be fair and balanced, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, uh, targeted returns. Uh, similarly, you know, you can include targeted returns if there's. You have to be prepared to back up your assumptions and the sound basis for that. Again, federal rules are even stricter on this, so oftentimes if you're using a placement agent, you'll have to actually include backup in the document or in whatever material you're using. 
And then there's prohibitions on use of testimonials, with certain limited exceptions if it's from a objective source, uh, like a, a ranking or something. Um, so these rules will continue to apply. So you have to think about how you do this if you're doing a video, or if you're doing a TV commercial, or if you're doing all these new types of materials will raise challenges about, you know, you got to make sure that you're talking about net performance. you got to make sure, I mean, what, what portfolio thing? managers get excited about their trades, as, as we should, right. right? But you can't, in an interview, say, hey, you know what, I bought this, I bought this at 10, I sold it in 20 the next day, it was a great trade. Right. I mean, you have an issue, you just pick that one, you, know, you can have a cherry picking. So you really have to sensitize people even more to these issues. I think it's funny about the advertising rules. I, I always find that people are uh, focused on the fact that they can't use graphs. No yeah. graphs, which yeah. I think is like yeah. slightly yeah. arbitrary. Yeah. Right. So okay. anyway, um, you know, one thing all funds should be thinking about is um, what uh, institutional and high net worth individuals are looking for when they are considering allocating to a fund. Uh, Prequin recently did a study, and uh, you know what they found by a pretty wide margin um, is that firm reputation is the number one characteristic uh, that allocators are looking for when considering investing in a fund. And you know what is firm reputation? It's your brand, uh, and so um, you know that's definitely uh, when when you embark on your campaign, how you uh, need to think about it. Look, everything we do is focused on ROI. Uh, one great aspect of that is that um, our uh, incentives and our clients' incentives uh, are are aligned, uh, and so you know I'm I'm just giving you a couple slides here on the basic process of um, you know what we do uh, in order to determine you know what are the best silos for you. You know it's quite possible that uh, as a fund. Uh, for whatever reason, digital might not make sense for you, and that your campaign needs to be heavy PR, right? So, uh, or it it could be that you know what you uh, uh, once we kind of go through our uh, our test, you know, it could be that look, you know, you would benefit the most actually from print media. Um, so, you know, it, it, advertising does not fit all funds uh, in the same way. Uh, and there's a uh, very quantitative way of figuring out what's going to be the most effective. But at the end of the day, we're going to recommend the strategy that has the highest ROI for uh, for the fund manager. Um, and you know, this is just a slide when I was talking about brand. You know, just you know, what do we do to get to your brand truth? Um, and you know, it's really going through a extensive process of boiling down your message. And you know, if you can really get to your brand to, uh, brand truth, then you're going to put yourself in a position uh, to get get the most at bats and get the most opportunities to sit down in front of allocators. Okay. So um, you know, here's a really interesting slide. Uh, this was actually a, a white paper self self published by Andreessen and Horowitz. So I don't know uh, if everyone out there knows who Andreessen is, but uh, he's the founder of Netscape. He has you know one of the uh, best reputations in Silicon Valley. And when he started his VC, I mean, even with his reputation, um, he could only raise $300 million. Uh, and they uh, then embarked on a uh, aggressive marketing and PR campaign, uh, and they fully uh, credit that marketing and PR campaign to vaulting them to uh, their number one VC. Um, so you know, this it definitely works, and um, you know, this is a, a great way uh, to see that it does. It's very interesting. Um, so you know, this if you're going to think about working with an agency, uh, you know these three uh, next steps are you know what you should really uh, expect to go through when you're going to uh, put your, when you're going to begin your campaign. Um, okay. yeah, I think we're just about out of time, but um, we have received a lot of uh, good questions. Mitch, are there a couple questions? Maybe we have time for one or two. Sure, that would be great. And uh, and first, I would say thank you both. You've done a phenomenal job of a lot of tremendously useful information. Um, of the questions that I've seen, one of the things, uh, Steve, this is for you. Uh, how would someone actually measure ROI for an ad? Uh, you know, that's one of the questions that I've seen uh, a couple of times come into this uh, into the window. So, can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. So, you know, it depends on the medium. Um, you know, digital is the most measurable. Uh, you know, 
be it search or um, SEO, you know, whatever it might be, you know, we can really measure digital down to, you know, the click. And uh, what's interesting about that is, you know, that's why, um, you know, small funds should not be uh, discouraged and think, oh, we're too small to embark on a campaign. You know, never before in the history of advertising um, has uh, digital been so effective in regards to targeting. And, you know, you can really put together a comprehensive campaign uh, in a digital environment uh, in a, that, that's highly targeted and, you know, really gives you uh, the best, most measurable ROI. Funny enough, of all the silos, the, the second most measurable is actually experiential. Um, and, you know, from there, uh, it, it becomes more difficult to measure. You know, what, what we say about PR is, you know, you have to think about it in regards to waves. You know, PR uh, is something that can be extremely, extremely effective um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's not an overnight strategy, but done right, you know, at the end of the day, it really can get the consultant's phone to ring. Makes sense. It built the brand. Exactly. Thank you very much. And Brad, I have a question for you that came in. Uh, you know, you were talking about sort of the harmonization between the CFTC and the SEC as it relates to the JOBS Act. Is there any timetable as to when that actually is going to occur? We have... Um, it's a good question. I mean, I, I know a lot of people are anxiously uh, looking at this, and you know, through informal conversations with the CFTC, we understand that that uh, they are looking at this. That you know, the intent is to issue new rules and and to clear this up, um, but they have not yet, and we don't know an exact timetable. We're hopeful the sooner the better, but um, you know, through industry organizations, they they are. Many, many, uh, they are being <laughs> addressing the issue. So hopefully, uh, hopefully the government shutdown doesn't impact the timing either. So <laughs> that's absolutely true. I, I'm sure it's likely probably impacting some of the job or some of the advertisements from appearing. Okay, uh, Steve, I have one more that uh, that sort of came in, and, and I think it's right up your alley. Can you talk about PR as it would impact sort of the institutional investor? Is it, you know, is it there a different angle that someone would take? Well, you know, one thing I think is really effective is a, a ring fencing campaign. You know, one thing that's great in our digital world is, so for instance, you know, if your target is, let's say, fire police in, in the southeast U.S., um, you know, you, you, can, you can get a sense of who's really you know, making those decisions, you know, who are on those boards, what are their, uh, you know, likes and dislikes. All that information is out there. And, um, you know, you can then use a PR campaign to, you know, influence them. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, what are you trying to do, let's say, with, with, the, with the boards of these, uh, you know, the, the fire and police, these allocators, is, you know, they're going to go back to their consultant. So what you're trying to do is have a PR campaign that will get the consultant's phone to ring. And, uh, you know, if, if you have this thought process about a ring fencing PR campaign, it's a very effective way to do that. It's a very effective way to plant the seed. Great. Thank you. I think I have time for one more. And so uh, this one would be for you, Brad. Obviously, uh, you know, the impact of all of these rules and these solutions of advertising are all focused on the U.S. And uh, what about the restrictions for the EU under AIFMD? Uh, are there any practical solutions out there that would enable a manager to advertise in those regions? Yeah, I mean, I really think it's a tough question. I think you really it can be done, but you need to consider which countries that you're looking at in the EU and talk to your council about the specific rules in those countries and just make sure what you're putting up is not going to box you in a corner and, and would not be considered marketing in those particular countries because each country is coming out with its own definitions. Uh, the EU directive applies to the entire EU, but each country has to implement it. Um, so what's marketing in one country may not be in another. You may have more flexibility. So, uh, but you know, make sure your you know your websites are that there's blockers when you go in. You know that you're U.S. or you. EU and then that you have some clear disclaimers on there as well to protect yourself. Right, and I'd imagine this also impacts what Steve does with regards to advertising. Uh, those ads can only be visible to U.S. eyes. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, there's practically you got to think about how you can accomplish that because once it's on the web, you know. You're <laughs> exactly. That's exactly. Well, I want to thank you both again uh, for your expertise today. Uh, I want to thank LSE Media and Marketing for your sponsorship. And I want to thank all the webinar attendees for this HFA webinar. Uh, just to give you an update, you're going to receive the link to the full presentation. Uh, so if there's a part you missed or you want to expand upon, you're going to be able to see that, uh, all of the slides. In addition, you're going to receive the contact details for our speakers and our sponsor. And if you're not yet an HFA member, we're going to include a special incentive to encourage you to join. So thank you, everyone. And with that, we'll close today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you.